Hi, this is Glenn Lowry. This clip is taken from a conversation I recently posted at my Patreon page. The full episode will be available for free in a few days, but if you want to see it now and support the show, please go to patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show. That's patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show. Thanks. Oftentimes over the years, you've mentioned, you know, the, these great Jewish intellectuals who trained you. And I want to know if you could just talk about that a bit. So let me just, like, like historically, you know, Solo is, you know, comes from a similar working class background. I imagine Samuelson does as well. I imagine almost all of these guys do as well. So they're at the height of their career. They're 40, they're 50. I mean, Solo, I think, was only actually he was 50. Um, he, so 50 in the 70s when you get there. Um, and they're, now they're training a young black kid from the south side of Chicago. So I was just wondering, like, what role do these, like, Jewish figures play? Because they seem to play just things I picked up over the years, a pretty big role in your imagination of what, like, a good intellectual is, of what a great intellectual is. So much to the point where you oftentimes, when you're criticizing black culture, you implicitly or explicitly compare it to, like, Jewish culture. Uh, in a sense that like Jews, Jews do this and, and we don't do this. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a Jew from South Brooklyn. I, I get it. You know, there is an emphasis on learning, blah, blah, blah. But I would, they, they, they seem to occupy a very central place in your imagination. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, I mean, first of all, everybody was Jewish. <laughs> I know, it's true. I mean, they really are. Let me just run down the list. Franco Modigliani, the great Italian uh, macroeconomist, monetary economist, Jewish Robert Solo, the great... Uh, economic, applied economic theorists and growth theory was Jewish. Paul Samuelson, the great, you know, sort of father of modern math, uh, math oriented economics. Peter Diamond, who was young in uh, the early 1970s, uh, uh, was Jewish. Uh, Richard Eckhaus, who was a development economist, not of the same degree of distinction as those who I've just mentioned, but he was a professor at MIT in those years. Uh, was Jewish. Peter Timmon, the economic historian, was Jewish. Stanley Fisher, uh, the uh, head of the IMF economic analysis and uh, uh, governor of the Bank of Israel in the later part of his career, but I can remember him running around with his shirt sleeves rolled up, a very energetic, young, brilliant monetary economist, uh, was Jewish. Franklin Fisher, the uh, great uh, econometrician who ended up uh, representing IBM in its uh, big uh, antitrust lawsuit as an analytical expert uh, against the U.S. Justice Department was Jewish. I haven't even really gotten started. Everybody was Jewish. Yeah, okay. I mean, then you're almost Marvin. literally, almost literally, it was true. MIT's ethos Im implicitly embodied Jewish aspiration because the the department came into existence because the anti-Semites at Harvard refused to acknowledge Paul Samuelson's uh, visionary, uh, profound and revolutionary genius. They, they, they wouldn't credit him with the chair that he had earned by 1945 uh, in economics. I'd hardly, he was along with Sir John Hicks in Britain and you know, a few others, uh, among the top five economists on the planet. Uh, and he couldn't get a chair at Harvard and he moved down the river to MIT uh, which was a bunch of Quonset huts uh, in uh, the late 1940s. And he started a department. Uh, and by the time you come along, and it's only 20 years later, it's the greatest department in the world. And it was not officially, but informally, it was a very Jewish environment. Not that people were wearing yarmulkes or they were saying prayers or requiring anything like that. It, it just was in the air. I mean, it was, you know. Now, in some of these people were quite aware of their Jewishness and quite aware of my blackness. Uh, they, they were all progressives uh, of some stripe or another using modern day language. They all wanted to make the world a better place. They all believed in the power of the government to do so, notwithstanding a commitment to rigorous economic principle and uh, a kind of recognition of, you know, the limits and the constraints uh, and the prices. Um, uh, they they were keenly aware of the of the urban crisis. What in those years would have been called the urban crisis, of uh, the, the of the uh, unfulfilled aspiration of African Americans to a seat at the table. MIT in 1970 started an affirmative action program in its PhD program. They had roughly 25 new students coming in a year. You have to understand again. 
this is the best department on the planet. Of course, they would argue with you at Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Berkeley, but they would have been wrong. They, they, I mean, I'm, I'm prepared to defend this claim that in 1970, MIT was the best economics department in the planet. And they brought in 25 or so students every year into the PhD program. It was hard to get in, very hard to get in. And they made the commitment to setting aside three of those positions of the 25 new students every year for African-American applicants. And for a period of time, it was an experiment. The experiment didn't continue through the late 70s, but it went on probably for six, seven, eight years. It was, you could argue about how successful it was. Some kids completed and are distinguished economists to this day. I won't embarrass them by naming people, but you know, others didn't you know, complete and were probably a bit over their heads at MIT. It was a very, very tough place to be in terms of the competition in the classroom because these are the best people on the planet uh, who had come there to study. Um, but um, they instituted an affirmative. This is way before anybody was going around mandate the Baki, the Baki case, the kind of, you know, watershed affirmative action uh, legal cases in the late 1970s. This is 1970 when they're doing this. Um, Bob Solo, uh, who was a uh, towering figure in the theory of economic growth, uh, decided to devote himself to urban economic study for years. He was writing uh, papers. Uh, I don't think many of them are well remembered now, uh, in which he took the uh, beauty of this uh, optimal control theory, this dynamic uh, uh, optimal uh, control theory, and he applied it to the organization of economic activity in space. Uh, there was a kind of you know, isomorphism between T representing the date at which an action was taking place to T representing how far you were from the central business district so that you could, uh, you know, formalize the trade-offs between uh, taking on economic activity here versus there in terms of the same mathematical language that they had been using to formalize the trade-off between making investments and enhanced uh, productive facilities now rather than later. Um, but but he, he turned his attention to uh, uh, to those issues, and uh, there were a hundred things that he could have been uh, working on besides. Um, I, I can remember being taken aside and counseled by some of my teachers about what it meant uh, to be an African American uh, with with talent, uh, you know, functioning at, at the top of my class. If I can say this, I, I did all right at MIT. I I, I was very uh, well trained there and I, and I performed very well there and people recognized it. And the burdens that I would carry as an African American, because I would be expected to address myself to a broader range of questions than simply the I dotting and T crossing, uh, you know, the epsilons and deltas and the limits as T goes to infinity and the, you know, uh, convex analysis kind of uh, manipulations. I would be expected to address myself to poverty. I'd be expected to talk about discrimination and racism. I, I'd be expected to evaluate. And invitations started coming to get involved in these activities even before I completed my dissertation. Um, so uh, when I chose as the topic of my dissertation that I wanted to study the dynamics of racial inequality across generations and in the long run, and I could go into details if you ask me about it, but that's not the main point here. I was encouraged by people. No one came to me and said, uh, that's, uh, you know, who's going to be interested in that topic. Um, they, they wanted to make sure that I was maintaining standards of rigor and that I wasn't lapsing into a kind of propagandistic, um, you know, tendentious thing. There were high standards for economic uh, analysis, but the, the subject matter, uh, it was welcomed. Um, and I can remember being taken aside by a couple of uh, more senior graduate students um, who were, uh, who, I, who I met, I met the first year that I came into the program. Uh, and again, uh, these are Jewish guys, as it happened, Steve Chevelle and Meyer Cohn. Meyer was an Israeli. Steve is an American Jew from New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they said, they, they told me, do you know who David Blackwell is? And as it happened, I did know who David Blackwell was. Uh, he's a black guy who's a, a mathematical statistician, and he's made these fundamental contributions to the theory of dynamic programming and to the, the theory of uh, statistical decision theory and whatnot. And they said, be like him. 
don't be a this these were colleagues students fellow students counseling me a newcomer don't fall into the professional black you know kind of posture don't don't you know stick to your knitting uh, master the techniques and be a scientist and then you will have demonstrated that there can be black scientists who can operate just as David Blackwell is operating at the very highest level. Um, I had mixed feelings about that advice, to be honest with you. Uh, it was well intended. Um, I kind of followed it for a decade, but I didn't stick with it. I, I, I became uh, a more political and social critical oriented uh, intellectual. But um, uh, am I answering you? I don't know if I'm answering you or not. It was a very Jewish department. Uh, the, the ethos of commitment to social justice that one associates with uh, liberal Jews was very much present. Um, the interest in me as an African-American, talented, young economist in the making, uh, I think, resonated with many of my teachers in part because of their uh, Jewish commitments, although it did so in a way that would always have them affirming for me the importance of rigor and seriousness of your of of your analysis. No, no, you did answer my question in part. I guess just to to put it, you know, to just ask it very starkly. Did there was there something about like quote unquote Jewish culture that appealed to you? Because I did hear you over the years. I didn't answer that part of your compared. question. I, I talked That's about the Jewishness of the institution and and how that affected the institution and affected me. But I didn't talk about my reaction to the Jewishness of the institution. Um, I loved that Samuelson story. I mean, to me, that Samuelson story is exactly what Malcolm X would have wanted. It, I don't know if anybody understands what I'm talking about here. Malcolm X would have said, don't be standing around waiting for the white man to save you. He's not coming. OK, and if he comes, he's only coming to patronize you and pat you on the head. Get busy building your life. Build your community, start a business, educate your children, clean up your act, stand up straight. This is Malcolm X. He's also got his fist balled up like this, and he's not taking anything from racism and the ballot or the bullet and all of that. But Malcolm X was very much about, will you please get it done? Do you think these people actually care about you? Paul Samuelson's reaction to anti-Semitism at Harvard, which was to put his head down and write another five foundational papers on the transfer problem or on the factor price equalization or on um, uh, public goods economics or on um, uh, one of my favorites is with or without the social contrivance of money. This is his, uh, his paper on overlapping generations. I'm sorry, I don't remember the title of the paper, but it'd be very easy to look up journal political economy, 1958, uh, uh, his paper on the on, uh, theory of interest that introduces a, a, a profound conceptual device, the overlapping generations model where people are dependent for their consumption possibilities today on decisions that are being made in anticipation of what's gonna be available tomorrow in a infinitely, uh, there's no terminal date. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I wish I could remember the name of this paper, but in any case, Paul Samuelson's answer to anti-Semitism was to change the field with his, with his head. Um, uh, every one of those people that I can remember now whom I've named, who I encountered when I was in graduate school, however Jewish they might have been, uh, were uh, determining their own fate by the, 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 the uh, weight of what it is that they, they brought to the table of, of their hard work, of their, of their commitment to their craft, of, of their discipline, uh, of their depth, of their seriousness of, of mind, um, and, and so on. And, and I thought if you're going to be an underdog, I mean, I didn't know chapter and verse and every detail about what happened in Germany between 1933 and 1935, but I knew enough. Nothing great. I, I, I knew enough to know that this was, you know, you think the world is dealing you a bad hand. You know, the world doesn't have to be your friend. On the other hand, your fate does lie to a substantial degree within your own hands. And yes, I did associate that with Jewishness somehow, and perhaps this is my error, um, but um, such was my social conditioning and, and my placement and the influences on me that um, I came to look upon uh, Jewish academic success as a model 
and uh, Jewish response to oppression and and uh, 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 disaster uh, uh, as something that had much to commend it. And it's very unfair, I should think, to say, be like the Jews, to say that to anybody. Because groups of people can't simply be like one thing or the other. That's a kind of trivial uh, trivialization. Um, but there's nothing wrong with being inspired by the Jews. And I was. 